First, I'll just introduce the panelists. So, uh, Dr. Dori Mason, an Anishinaabe Chicana scholar who is faculty at UBC's First Nations and Indigenous Studies Department and Department of our Program and Department of English. Dr. Nason's research and writing focus on Indigenous feminist literature and creative activism, and this year saw the publication of her co-edited book on the works of E. Pauline Johnson, and she's currently working on a forthcoming book, Red Feminist Criticism, Indigenous Women, Activism, and Cultural Production. Next we have Dr. Marianne Nicholson, Zaya Gila Ogwa, did I pronounce that right? An artist of Scottish and Zawadina descent of the Kokwakiwak Nation. Marianne's training encompasses both traditional Kokwakiwak forms and culture and Western European-based art practice, and her work engages with issues of Indigenous histories and politics arising from a passionate involvement in cultural revitalization and sustainability. She holds a PhD in linguistics, anthropology, and art history from UVic, and her widely celebrated work has been exhibited locally, nationally, and internationally. And next we have Tara Hogue, a curator and writer of Dutch, French, and Métis ancestry, originally from the Prairies. She holds an MA in Art History and Critical, Art History, Critical and Curatorial Studies from UBC, and is the Aboriginal Curatorial Resident at Grunt Gallery, where she recently coordinated Arctic Noise in conjunction with the 21st International Symposium on Electronic Arts. She's also currently the lead curator on the Call Response Project with Maria Hupfield and Tanya Willard, along with invited artists Christy Belcourt, Ursula Johnson, and Lak Lakuluk, uh, Williamson Bathory. Tara was recently awarded the Audain Aboriginal Fellowship with the Art Gallery of Greater Victoria, and has forthcoming projects with the Balkan Art Gallery and SFU Gallery uh, this year. And finally, Raymond Boisjoli is a celebrated artist of Haida and Quebecois ancestry, whose artwork has been featured in solo and group exhibitions across Canada, the United States, and internationally. The online bio has a very extensive list that I thought I would leave up to you to read at your leisure. His practice concerns the deployment of images, objects, and materials in and as Indigenous art, investigating technology, Aboriginal identity, the relationship between text and image, image as well as the limits of the visible. Raymond holds an MFA in studio art from UBC and is an assistant professor of interdisciplinary studio in the Department of Visual Art and Material Practice at Emily Carr University of Art and Design. Um, and there are more extensive bios available on the event page on um, the website for this event. So I think we'll start with uh, Dory, if you wanna begin your comments and move this way um, and have response uh, from the filmmakers as you'd like. Hi everyone, um, I wanted to start by thanking uh, Om and the organizers for uh, asking me to fill in for my colleague Glenn Coulthard who was originally going to be the speaker or the academic voice on the panel, um, but he had to uh, be home for an event out there. I also want to acknowledge that I live and work on Musqueam territory at UBC um, and it's also where I make my home so I have a special um, a thanks to give that community for being such, um, a, a, such good host to me. Uh, someone who's an uninvited guest from the U.S. Um, I almost didn't come today just because I've been in deep mourning <laughs> um, and fearful and very sad all day, um, but I knew that I wanted to come and support Maya and Banshee, but also because their stories that I've used in my classes over and over again always lift me up, lift my students up, and bring to the table really compassionate but tough questions about what it is that we do when we're telling these stories. And so, um, you know, from Maya's activist work to the like loving portraits that she has of her family, um, to the to uh, the narrative films that also take up issues of, of gender violence and and how Indigenous women keep, keep each other safe um, through their stories and through the relationships that they build with one another has always been something that's been really helpful to me. Um, <clears throat> Banshee's film. I was I was walking in with my partner. And he asked. I, you show that film in your classes, don't you? And I said, I think I show it in every class. <laughs> and for similar reasons, because um, when we talk about academically these things around representation or ethics or relationality, I think she captures it so beautifully in the way that she frames the narrative of just the question, like what is, what is the right thing to do? Um, but also framing it so beautifully with her mother, her grandmother's 
silence, but also for grandmother's practice. So the framing of the question with the preparing of the fish, I think is just such a beautiful metaphor about what we do for each other to keep those stories going and how we sustain each other um, when there's difficult things happening in the world like there is now. Um, the final remark I wanted to just touch on was that I was happy to see that um, Maya had put the short that she just recently did on immigration and detention in Canada and um, you know, part of my sadness and, and fear and grief is, you know, for many reasons in terms of what happened yesterday in the U.S., um, but also uh, in terms of my concern as a Latino woman and the real fear and anxiety and sadness that my brothers and sisters who are um, in the U.S. who are Latino are going through. And so, anyway, I just wanted to thank Maya for making that film and creating a conversation about how we think about these things across um, not only tribal nations but across um, borders um, and the ways that we need to kind of break down those borders so that we have a better practice. So uh, I hold my hands up to both of you for giving me so much to work with and so much to talk about with my students and you guys do all the teaching for me in those instances so thank you. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't paying attention when you gave us the <laughs> instructions. <laughs> I think I figured it out, though. Uh, I just wanted to respond to Dory. And, um, if, if it wasn't for the classes I took um, from Dory at, at UBC um, in the First Nations Studies program, which is now the First Nations and Indigenous Studies program, I wouldn't be where I am today. Um, no, it's true. <laughs> she, she's an excellent educator and um, just teaches with such love and passion and um, she's just so fierce um, and I, I think that a lot of um, indigenous women and non-indigenous women who graduate from that program um, feel the same way and that it, it was a real honor to, to be in your classes and to now call you a friend and yeah so thank you. <laughs> Did you guys have anything more before? Okay. <laughs> I will ask a question at the end. I'll have to remember it. Um, one of the things that really struck me in watching these films, and, and I found them to be really powerful, and actually in a way, um, I, I found that uh, they, they fed my soul, and that is something that is badly needed. Uh, you know, coming out of the our history, um, in particular to myself and to Sarah of the Kwak Kwak Yuak, um, there was a story that was collected years ago, maybe a hundred years ago, um, by George Hunt. And he, um, there was a woman and she had lost one of her male relatives and she was crying, giving this kind of a cry song. And what she did, and this thing took hours and hours and hours for her to kind of narrate. It was like 24 generations of her family's history. So she had memorized that, and she was going back and reciting it. And, and uh, George Hunt was fortunate enough to, to record that. And I think, was thinking about that when I was watching these films and really struck by the autobiographical nature of those things. And I know one of the questions that was posed um, a long time ago to, to uh, George Hunt when he was collecting um, these stories from the Kwak Kwak Kiwak, and people were saying, you know, you're, you're taking our stories, you're recording them, you know, what are you doing? But there were many people that collaborated with him and, and chose to sit down with him and tell him their stories. And now, years later, generations later, um, members like myself have access to those stories and now we're bringing them back to the communities and to the families uh, to which they belong. And there's something extraordinarily powerful about that act. And one of the things that I wanted to ask um, 
when I was watching um, the films is I do get the sense of yourself as a person, as individuals, within the context or the frame of, of your um, extended uh, sense of yourself through your kinship um, that comes through uh, the films that you're making. And my question is pretty open-ended, um, but I wanted to ask about vulnerability, and I wanted to ask, you know, how you feel uh, when you're um, going through the process of putting this story um, out into into the public. Cry Rock is is a is a really important film in terms of in terms of um, in terms of ethics and and how to operate um, within our own protocols and and respecting our families and our teachings and um, that film had a huge influence on me back when I was um, back when I was in school and I think I think it might have been Dory who showed me that film. <laughs> um, yeah, so I just want to say that, that I think that's a really important um, film just in terms of, 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 of respectful practice and ethical practice as, as an indigenous filmmaker. Um, so for me, I mean, whenever I'm telling these kind of personal stories, it's, it's so important to, to recognize that it's not just my story, it's my family's story, my community's story, and... Um, It'll be my children's story and my grandchildren's story, right? So it's it's really important to consider to consider them um, throughout throughout the making of the film and developing the film. And um, something that I I started talking about um, more with Helen Haig Brown, who's here, who's a really talented filmmaker, uh, and Lisa Jackson was about um, the dissemination of of the films. Um, so I had. You know, during the process of making Bihtosh, I had um, I'd included my family. They were the first to see the rough cut. They were the first to see the final cut. They read various drafts of the script, and um, my parents gave me their blessing before I ever made the film, and that was critical to me, was to, to make sure that I had their blessing and um, to, to do the story, or to, tell, to, to make the film um, with their support. Um, but I hadn't, I hadn't considered um, I guess the ethical protocol of what to do once the film is finished. Um, because generally when you make a film, you submit it to festivals and then um, hopefully you get a distributor and you know, it plays in places all over, you know, in art galleries and settings like this in people's living rooms on airplanes. Um, and, and people you will never meet will see your film. And with this film, it's like, it's obviously a very, very personal um, memoir and I hadn't really considered that, you know, I hadn't considered talking to my family about that part of, of the film because it continues to have a life of its own. Um, so I went and submitted it to all these festivals and then realized, I guess like six months after, like I didn't even ask my parents if they were okay with that. I didn't even ask my dad if he was okay with that. And it didn't occur to me until it was going to screen for a Sami audience that I hadn't asked him that question. Um, and that, I think it was a really important learning experience for me. Um, and that's something I, I, I'll now do with, with my work in terms of the more personal stuff like this. Maybe I'll say just a little bit more. And thank you for responding to that question because it's something I'm really um, intrigued by because I think the very act of telling us our story or putting it out into the public, in whatever that public realm is, is, is a very vulnerable act. Um, but what I see, and the way that I perceive the works, is that it's a very um, powerful act, and that being because it's very much positioned um, within the context of your particular histories. Um, and it's done very, very res respectfully. And 
I know I can, I'm saying these things because I really can relate to it. And when I was younger and sitting at the dinner table and my Uncle Ernie um, would tell us our origin story, and he would tell it to us over and over and over again to the point where he would start telling it for the 10th time and I would just think, oh my God, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be so bored. And it wasn't until years later, you know, um, that I realized what, that, what a gift that was and what he was really trying to tell me. And he was really trying to say, you know, this is your very beginning, you know, not when you, not the day you were born, but the day that our ancient ancestor first came into this valley, that is when you began. And that, that was a, it took a long, long time for me to understand that. And I guess I really appreciate um, the films that you guys are creating and making and the way that you're um, expressing your connection to the people around you because I think that our stories are deeply embedded in, in both our bodies and in the lands that we occupy. And I see those reflections within the works that you're creating. So I'm, I'm very grateful for your capacity to allow yourself to be vulnerable and to show that, um, or to speak that voice publicly. So uh, I wanted to say that. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Um, I wanted to. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. <laughs> uh, I wanted to pick up on sort of what Marianne was saying because I was thinking a lot about um, how as a body of work both of your films are so uh, generous and, and brave. Um, and Elmaya, your, your Hitos film, I said that wrong, <laughs> it struck a chord for me personally because I've experienced suicide in my family and for that to be the first words that are uh, on the screen in that work is really uh, brave, I think, and profound and um, important for us to open a dialogue around, you know, these things that affect our communities and our families so, so deeply. Um, and I was also thinking about uh, some words from a Cree woman, Alex Wilson, who uh, was talking about the Saskatchewan River Delta. And her community has words for the beginning of the river, and they have words for both ice ages. And so their existence on that land is firmly entrenched through time uh, and in relation to the river and she talks about uh, language as um, being made up of atoms and molecules the same way that the rest of life on Earth is. And I was thinking a lot about that, Benchy, and when I was watching your videos. Um, and the way that these stories are embedded in our blood memory and in how important it is to be out in those surroundings to, you know, to actually remember those things and um, to cement them in your mind. Um, yeah, so I think, well, the w one question that I did have um, was around uh, Elmaya, the project that Mitos came out of, um, which what was the name of the collective? The Embargo. The Embargo collective. collective, right. So you said that you would have never made that film if you weren't challenged to do so. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Um, well, <laughs> uh, the Embargo Collective um, first happened uh, six or seven years ago. Helen Haig Brown is one of the uh, the first Embargo Collective members, um, and the Embargo Collective was a commission by the Imaginative Film Festival, um, and they did it six or seven years ago, and it was inspired maybe yes, anyway it was inspired by Lars von Trier's The Five Obstructions, um, and the idea is that in placing restrictions um, on yourself creativity creatively creatively. Uh, 
you will foster new creativity or open open new doors in your mind. Um, so a group of indigenous filmmakers from all over the world was part of this first embargo collective. Um, and it was Dennis Goulet who um, was kind of the mastermind behind that and she made it happen. And then Dennis decided to bring back the embargo collective uh, five years later. Was it five years later? <laughs> Uh, yeah, and she, she brought back three of the original Embargo members and then three emerging filmmakers. And um, the second time around, it was all women. And so um, everybody in the room brought something really different, um, style-wise and just um, voice-wise. And we all just really loved each other's work, so we decided what we would do is to put our names in a hat, and then whoever's name you drew, you'd have to make a film inspired by that person's work. Um, so I drew Lisa Jackson's name and made a film um, inspired by her first film, Suckerfish, which is this really um, personal, um, unconventional documentary about her relationship with her mother, who uh, was an Indian residential school survivor. Um, she went to the Mohawk Institute Residential School, or the Mush Hole, and um, battled substance abuse issues and um, Lisa had a difficult relationship with her so um, that film was kind of the template for Bihidosh and I, I, I really wouldn't have made that film <laughs> otherwise <laughs> and sometimes I almost regret making it in some ways but um, I guess there was a reason why I had to make it. Uh, I really appreciate seeing these works, you know, ganged up like that. Like, uh, like it really feels as though it's that thing where it's like, I went through that, now I'm going through this. Like, it, it really is something more carried through very skillfully. Both of you take it very seriously, and that's something that obviously we benefit from. Uh, so I really appreciate that. And there were these things I was thinking of in terms of seeing them and thinking, like, what is the possible way in which I can, like, think through the way in which these are sequenced and come to some idea about, uh, you know, what the significance of that is, uh, seeing all of this, uh, all of this, you know, increasing reflexiveness that Cry Rock, which was a new film to me, was like, uh, uh, you know, demonstrating this reflexivity and this, like, responsibility to think of the circumstances in which we might relate the stories of others and what's at stake in that, and to think of the fact that, oh, it's like filmmaking is also about participating in that same process in terms of communicating narratives to others with different cultural circumstances. Uh, it might be in, like, uh, complex cultural circumstances such as this one, where we're all coming from uh, diverse places with diverse interests. In this case, our interests converge uh, meaningfully that uh, it's something that I'm uh, very interested in, in thinking through and simply hearing that your first encounter with it, Maya, is potentially in Dor Dory's class. Uh, that I guess my sort of question is like, uh, is it an exciting thing to be able to work in the context of one another as, you know, being constituents of a, a growing community of indigenous filmmakers? Is this, is this dialogue part of the interest in making that film? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, no, I never imagined uh, that, you know, the first time I saw Cry Rock, I never imagined that, I don't know, like eight, seven years later, or six years later, I'd be sitting on a panel with <laughs> Bad Jihanus and talking about my work as a filmmaker, because I didn't become a filmmaker until, uh, I guess I've been making films for about five years now, and that was one of uh, the more influential works on, on what inspired me to become a filmmaker to begin with, because I hadn't really been exposed to um, the body of, of work out there that that exists with indigenous film because it's not necessarily all that accessible to the general public. And so um, it took me going 
to post-secondary and taking First Nation studies and being in, in people like Dory's classes to be exposed to the world of Indigenous film. And I think a lot has changed since I first uh, went to UBC um, in terms of the film community. Um, and I think it's it's growing so fast. It's it's an incredible um, it's an incredible thing to witness. Um, I got to be at the opening night of Imaginative this year, and Alethea Arnacook Burial's film Angry Inuk opened the festival, and um, Alethea was part of the Embargo um, Two Collective, and um, it's just it's just so wonderful to witness this growing community where we support each other, we celebrate each other's work, um, and there's a place for our work because it doesn't necessarily have space in, in the conventional mainstream festivals and that's a problem it's a big problem um, but within our own festival like Imagine Native and other um, smaller indigenous film festivals it's it's wonderful to have a place where your work fits um, and where you don't have to explain your work you don't have to explain the, the process of it necessarily um, and you don't have to answer like the sort of like representation 101 questions um, and you can have enriching, meaningful conversations with other people in your community who actually get it. Um, but I think we're also at a point where um, we don't necessarily have to like each other's films either, and I think that's a good place to be at too, that there's so many indigenous films out there that we're at a point where you don't have to necessarily celebrate every film that gets made. But there's a place for critique, which is a cool thing. I think, I think it means that we've arrived somewhere where there's room for our, our craft and our work to grow um, and, and, and become something more than, um, than what it was maybe 15 years ago. And um, it's also important to recognize, yeah, the work that so many others have done before us. Um, yeah, I don't know if that really answers all your questions, but... <laughs> Any other like comments from the panel? <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any other questions or comments before we um, invite questions from the audience? Okay, it's your turn. Um, I'm not sure, I wasn't told that I'm supposed to... Oh, you have one. Okay, I was going to walk with the audience. Havana uh, like fashion. <laughs> so we'll open it up now for... Or questions from any of you? You know, from Bella Coola, uh, same place as Patsy, and, uh, and uh, I appreciate both of your films. I was just wondering, in regards to your father, um, like you said you didn't have permission to, uh, to talk about the things that um, around the film, like his deep, dark place, and um, his, uh, his drinking uh, accelerated after he left his mom, after your mom left. And uh, some of those kind of statements that were, um, men don't know how to respond uh, when confronted with those uh, issues. Um, no, it might be reaction to reactionary. And um, uh, how did he respond when he saw? It? Uh, is this, yeah, it's on. Uh, well, my I, I made sure to get permission from my dad um, before before even starting the process of making that film, um, and he had only um, disclosed his. His, his stories to me about that time, maybe a year and a half before I started making the film, so it was very new um, to me and to my family. It was something he hadn't opened up about until that point. Um, so it was a really, it was a really delicate process. Um, but yeah, I, I got his permission and then he was the first to see the rough cut and then the final cut of the film. and. Um, he didn't say much, actually. <laughs> uh, he didn't. He didn't respond to me because uh, he he lives overseas and sat me, 
Um, it took him like a week or two before he responded to my email with the link, so I was like dying, <laughs> waiting for some response from him. Uh, but then he said he liked it and that it almost made him cry. So. <laughs> 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 That's about as far as he went with the whole emotional aspect. But yeah, I agree. I think um, it is a difficult thing for, for men to talk about about those issues and, and it's been really damaging for our communities for for men in particular to 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 have experienced that abuse and then have to repress those those stories and that trauma and um, not have uh, I guess uh, how do you put it I don't know I to, to not have um, healthy ways of of revisiting that that history and dealing with it and, and healing, and I think that's why there's, that's obviously why there's so many people who are, so many men in particular who are, who are dealing with um, alcoholism and drugs and all the other stuff that you deal with when you're living with that kind of um, trauma. It's actually your comments just right now that made me wonder, it, um, with the Embargo Project, so many of the filmmakers or <laughs> creators are, are women, and I just wondered if there is a gendered aspect at all to the field, if there's a, or if it's just a simple, uh, too small a pool to make that kind of comment. Uh, yeah, I mean, the indigenous film community is kind of an anomaly um, in comparison to uh, the film yeah, the mainstream film and, and generally independent film um, where women are actually, um, oh, I don't want to say overrepresented. There's more, <laughs> there's more women making films than there are men in the indigenous film community. And um, maybe that just has to do with um, leadership in general in terms of um, women just doing it. Um, there's a lot of people who are self-taught within the indigenous film community, um, and maybe maybe that is also why it's gendered. It's just women picking it up and learning and just doing it. Um, and also the fact that so many of these women are telling such important stories that it's, it's more than just making a film, it's work. Um, it's something for your community, it's something for your family, and I think a lot of other indigenous women feel that way about their practice when it comes to making films. It's more than just making a film. It's, it's work, and you're contributing to a larger body of work that so many others have. Just uh, hearing a few of the questions about uh the male aspect of things and how it's hard for males to like men to communicate and and share their feelings um i'm 43 uh i've been an artist for 25 years and uh i i always felt like expressing myself through my art was a good way to express myself and how i was feeling because it was weird though when i'd create paintings sometimes i was sad or sometimes i was angry Sometimes I was frustrated. And people would always say, your work looks happy. <laughs> so I get kind of confused, but um, I, 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 like I said, I'm 43. I'm finally learning that our people have been suppressed for so long. Um, when the residential schools started to close and kids were finally starting to go home, they made laws that stated you couldn't express what happened to you in the residential school. So I think for men, that barrier is is not being heard, um, not being able to communicate what had happened to you as a, we've always been taught that being the man is being the man of the house and taking care of your family, regardless of of how hard things can get. And, um, and I, I'm just making points like you're saying, I'm not a filmmaker, but I think when you create something that reaches a certain amount of people, you're a filmmaker. Like you're, you, you're able to touch somebody's heart or mind, spirit. Um, I think because for a long time I didn't think I was a good artist, so I kind of didn't own it. 
but then I'd have people tell me you're a great artist. I'm like, well, I try, but but now I'm starting to own it. So own it, own own, own your filmmaking. You, you make films that people respect, people take in, and and um, I just want to congratulate you too. And uh, yeah, it was it was amazing to experience this and be a part of it. Thank you. Respond to that is I mean I was thinking about how um, how this history we talk about it in gender terms and how um, men in particular have a difficult time um, I guess processing and expressing the emotions but I think that that exists for women as well um, I don't necessarily have the words for it yet but I do think that. Um, I, I see it in the women in my family as well, this um, difficulty, um, difficulties with intimacy and expression of, of love and challenges with relationships. And um, I, yeah, I, I don't think it is necessarily just a thing uh, for men in, in terms of having difficulty expressing and, and, and processing and getting it out. I feel like there's like a, just a general repression of, of emotions and, because it's, it's easier, it, I mean, you don't want to let it out. If you let it out, then you have to deal with all of that stuff, right? So, yeah, so I think it exists with women too, just in different ways. I was wondering how important variety is for both of you. Because I know Banshee, you ran your radio station, and Maya, your work, you had the drama and the comedy. So it was really great to see that you have so much to offer in so many ways. So um, how do you use variety to keep yourself um, inspired? Uh, variety, I, I don't know. I guess it's, I, I didn't go to film school. I mean, I went to film school for acting a really long time ago, and that just like taught me how to cry and stuff. <laughs> useless. I already knew how to cry. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I didn't go to film school, so I kind of think of every film I make as just like an exercise, like learning and trying something different and figuring out if, if I can tell the story in a specific way. Um, I think each story also calls for a different um, means of communicating that story. Um, and the uh, Versa Air Colonia. Is Chandra still here? I think she may have left. Um, Versa Air Colonia, the last film, <laughs> the video piece, um, was kind of just a. Uh, Chandra and I decided we just wanted to make something that was purely fun and joyful and absurd. Um, actually, ever since making Bich I've had like a really challenging. Um, time personally just to dealing with with all of the stuff I, I brought up in the film and and navigating through that personally and dealing with what all that intergenerational trauma shit means to me every day um, so I just yeah and I, I found that it was like um, stunt, stunting my practice I wasn't I wasn't really creating much um, in the last couple of years um, so yeah, this uh, this Versa Col Versa Ear Colonian <laughs> thing was just um, an exercise in absurdity and, and just wanting to make something fun and not have to make something that was all about like sad things that you know you know every day you live every day yeah. Raymond was like, I hope she says the title of the film. <laughs> I don't know how to say it, but you don't know how to say it either. <laughs> we were just making fun of art speak because I can't read art speak. I don't understand it half the time. So, <laughs> so the call, the the parentheses and everything, the slashes. <laughs> Yeah, well, what are all the what are all the parentheses taken out of there? Because there was like a larger um, phrase. Can, do you remember? <laughs> uh, reconciliation was ion 
decolonization was the colon, colon, colon. <laughs> um, I can't even remember. It's something about interpersonal relationships. It was all just really absurd. Yeah. The thing that that film or video really like made me think about is uh, it's like oh I felt implicated. It's like <laughs> it's like uh, oh we're like asking Maya and Chandra to do this thing about like love, compassion, intimacy. And, in geopolitics, it's like, what's the time frame for this thing? What are they gonna do? It's like, oh, it's like, incidentally, it's like, oh, we've only curated indigenous people into this program, oh, oh no. <laughs> like, uh, so it definitely felt like, and seeing it in the context of this is useful in terms of seeing it as separate from whatever that thing was. Uh, just in terms of like giving me this sense of like a trajectory that it's like, oh yeah, it's like what, uh, simply because we're indigenous women, we're supposed to have like a super serious take on these issues. That's like, oh, to talk about love as indigenous people, it's like, is it going to be sad? It's like, oh, let's make it funny. It's like, oh, like, thank goodness. Like, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> That's how I felt. Too. It's just that, yeah, there's a, I guess, a pressure as, uh, in, as an indigenous filmmaker, and, sh and I'm sure artists feel this way too, like this pressure to always dwell in the sadness and, and the anger and the pain. And, um, in some ways, it just, it just becomes too much, and um, there needs to be more of a celebration as well. And I don't know, when I go to my grandparents' house and visit we don't talk about all the sad stuff you know they tell me stories and we laugh and we joke around and they bicker and that's not that's not part of how my family operates so it's like i want to incorporate that into my practice and my work and um yeah and, and also maybe um that film was or that video project i don't know i don't think it's really a film it's a video project um was all was was kind of for other in, indigenous people. We knew that there'd be like a, a fair amount of indigenous people in the audience, so we kind of just wanted to make something that they might enjoy watching too, and then make a statement also on like um, the the sort of like settler desire to consume indigenous trauma and like they expect pain and sadness and it's exhausting. Hello. Oh, sorry, talk about anxiety about expressing yourself. Sorry, oneself. Um, I'm an artist. Actually, Maynard and I both are Coast Salish artists. We make our living doing artwork. So a lot of our, I always define art as sort of the conveyance of meaning through other means. So it's not like just prose or just talking to somebody. You're trying to get something across that you can't get across normally. When I watched the films tonight, it was just so moving and you know and, and like I, I work in Coast Salish design and, and I'm obsessed with symbolism in Coast Salish design like our history our worldview our culture and even our law are codified into this means through this sophisticated complex symbolism and I often get frustrated that we can't express ourselves certainly because we've, we've lost a lot of that symbolism through the years but you know I also think about how to proliferate that meaning when I see film, you know, to be able to get that meaning across so almost like injecting it, you know, so quickly and, and you know, and I know the stories can be sad and, you know, I also know that they need to be told, you know, not just amongst ourselves but obviously to the wider non-Indigenous audience. I mean, truth necessitates justice. You know, I mean, people really need to hear these stories. But I, my question is sort of, how do you relate? You know, do you think about that sort of nexus between, um, you know, traditional art forms and storytelling? Because all our our art forms are actually again codifications of the stories, these these laws, these principles. 
do you ever think about the connection between that and, and obviously you do because especially in Cry Rock that was just writ large um, but getting these stories out through the film you know maybe more so Um, maybe you should go first. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know. I like. I don't. Um, I guess it's a little different with film because it's like I don't consider myself like a Blackfoot filmmaker in the sense that I make Blackfoot films. I'm just um, Blackfoot and Sami. I make films. I'm a person of. Blackfoot and Sami ancestry who makes films, um, and depending on what I'm making, um, I have like an onus and responsibility to my community, whether that be my Blackfoot community or my Sami community or my this community here in Vancouver um, or the Indigenous film community. Um, but then I also I I, can, I do consider myself a filmmaker and. Um, Something I've been thinking about the last couple of years is like, well, do I just have to make films with indigenous content? Um, you know, what what else can I tell stories about? Um, and and you know, what is indigenous film really? And um, th I guess that's a question we all kind of ask ourselves. But um, that that's where this whole uh, radio check project came from. Was I was um, I think about my friends. Here in the um, in the my, the community of um, basically people standing up for migrant rights in, in Vancouver, and their stories are are um, really touching, and um, I feel implicated in um, in in the marginalization of of, of migrants in, in Canada as a Canadian citizen who has. Um, certain privileges that migrants don't have, uh, undocumented migrants don't have, um, I felt implicated within that. Um, and I felt like I needed to um, show some sort of sense of like allyship or just just to talk about the injustice of it all. So um, yeah, I don't know, I guess it's it's complicated as, as a, an indigenous filmmaker, the Blackfoot and Sami person, like how does that fit in? within, how does that fit in the practice and how, how does that in some ways define who you are as a filmmaker or artist and in other ways how does it, um, how can it liberate you, I don't know. <laughs> but, um, and I was just going to ask, and, and she started to answer already, um, about up, upcoming projects that you're both working on. Yeah, I think I, I kind of already talked about um, the main project which is uh, our community was um, hit by fentanyl two years ago, and we were the first, basically, the first community in Canada to to be exposed to um, fentanyl as an illicit drug. And now we've seen what it's doing in Vancouver and all over North America. Um, and my mother's the physician there, and so she she saw a lot of that firsthand, and continues to see it firsthand. And um, our community. I mean, we lost over 20 people in one year to overdoses. Um, and so the community mobilized and did some really radical, took radical action um, to save lives. And um, that kind of led me down this path of learning about harm reduction and um, the science of addiction and um, sort of the history of healing modalities with, within an indigenous context and how we deal with addiction. And so what my community did was actually very radical and kind of against the grain, um, accepting that people are probably gonna continue to use these drugs, but we value their life over them being sober and clean. Um, so the film I'm working on right now is about um, harm reduction within an indigenous context and how does that work, how does it fit? Um, because I, it's just not uh, realistic to ask um, everyone to walk this red road, which is this path of sobriety and, and being clean and, and sober. Um, 
Anyway, so the film is about that. Uh, and then I, um, I'm hopefully going to be um, co-writing and co-directing a, a narrative feature next year. We've put in some applica an application for funding and we'll continue to do so and hopefully it'll happen uh, next year. And um, we're talking about some crazy conventions of how to shoot the film and it's a very like simple story but um, the way we want to do it is a little a little bit crazy, but it should be it should be fun. Hopefully, we get the funding for it. Right. Well, I think we'll uh, wrap up then. So uh, we we do have a bit of time to um, chat. So you'll be here, um, the filmmakers, and um, just want to thank you all for being here for your uh, questions and your attentiveness. And thanks so much to the filmmakers and our wonderful respondents. Um, and have a good evening. <laughs>